So that fellow couldn't join the church. He couldn't join the church. He couldn't get baptized. He couldn't get baptized. He woke up with God. He woke up with the devil. Are you saved? Amen. So that fellow didn't take the sacraments. Didn't take the sacraments. Didn't say the rosary. Didn't take the rosary. Didn't tithe. Didn't tithe. He went to heaven. He went to hell. You saved? Didn't keep the law. He didn't keep the law. He broke the commandments. He broke the commandments. He didn't keep the golden rule. He didn't keep the golden rule. He woke up in glory. He woke up in the pit. Are you saved? Amen. You're saved. If you're not saved, you're over here or you're over here. You sure ain't in the middle. He said, Lord, remember me, thou comest by kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and said, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be saved. It's like that. You have been saved? If you ever saved, you were saved like that. All right. In this video, I want to give an illustration of our hearts as depicted in the Bible. The Bible depicts our heart as soil, as the earth. And it also depicts our heart as our mind, as it talks about the imaginations and thoughts of our heart. And this is because the heart and mind are intertwined in a marriage the mind is like the the male the husband and the heart is like the female the wife and just like Eve was able to influence Adam so is our wife able to influence us and our heart to influence the mind and in a correct balance and order of things the mind needs to rule over the heart because the Bible talks about a heart being deceptively wicked. And this is why Adam was to rule over Eve, not like she's a slave, but to keep things in order because Satan knew this and he went to Eve when she was alone. And this is basically a, an example of how Satan works, where he's not going to come straight to you with his deception. He uses manipulation tactics to bypass your mind and get to your heart. That's why a lot of times with these arguments that you see in politics and in on media and even in religion, it bypasses your mind and gets straight into your feelings to talk about the emotional aspect of these things and how this is affecting the children and the, the elderly and, 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 and putting fear and getting into emotions so that you react emotionally and that you react from the heart and not from the mind. Not that you should drown out your heart and your feelings, but that you should temper them and control them to not let them take control. But to take that influence and actually apply it in a meaningful, productive manner. And that's why there's a lot of tactics out there, such as NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, which is a basically a type of hypnotism where it bypasses your mind to get into the subconscious to influence you. And again, that's trying to get to Eve by just ignoring Adam. Because if you can get to Eve, you can get to the subconscious, you can get into the heart, then you can influence Adam, the conscious mind, who you are, right? So Adam needs to be on alert. He was supposed to tend the garden, right? The heart, Eve, is supposed to take care of her. But he wasn't doing that when she went over to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You see, what this is like is your your thoughts, the things you meditate upon and think about. You, you're dropping those words into your heart because the words end up being like seeds. So when you, you drop a seed, let's use something black because a seed has to die before it germinates. And black usually represents death here. So we'll use a black to represent a seed. 
kind of like a, a watermelon seed or something. And let's say you drop a seed that says there is no God and you start to contemplate and meditate upon that. That drops into your heart. You're feeding that to your Eve, your wife. And Eve, like the earth, can only use what she is given. So if you give her a seed for tomatoes, she can only grow the tomatoes. But if you give her a seed for poison ivy, you can't get upset that she didn't grow tomatoes because you gave a seed for poison ivy. So whatever you're going to give her, that's what she's going to grow. Such as if you give your wife your seed, she's going to have your child. But if you're some kind of cuck or something or she's having an affair and she receives some other man's seed, of course it's not going to be your child, right? This is obvious and shouldn't have to be said, but sometimes it seems to have to be said. So you drop this seed into your heart about there being no God. Well, that doesn't mean it's going to germinate. But then you, you keep talking about that, right? There is no God. You dropped another seed in there. That might not germinate. But you, later on, you're, you're discussing it with other people, right? You dropped another seed. Now, they may not germinate, right? You're just entertaining the idea. Well, these seeds are still in the heart. And at any time, they can receive water or they can receive light. And these can start the germination process. Now, ultimately, what you want is for these seeds to actually be the word of God. Because the word of God is seed, as we're told in Luke chapter 8 about the parable of the sower. Jesus says that the seed is the word of God. And that basically the, the sower who's throwing out seeds is throwing out the word of God to the hearts and minds of the world. And as we're told in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 23 through 25, we are born again by that incorruptible seed, by the word of God, which is the gospel that is preached onto us. And that gospel is the good news of our salvation. And this seed would basically be that. So it'd be like dropping the seed of, hey, you're a sinner. You don't deserve heaven. To enter heaven, you have to be perfect and blameless and innocent and righteous. None of us are. In thought, word, and deed, we all fail. And we need to eat the humble pie to admit we are in the same damnation that everybody else is in. So when we look at them and think, oh, the, look at these people. They are worse sinners than I am, right? They don't mind going into these places and stealing everything or they, they raping people or they're murdering people or the things that they're doing for to children to get adrenochrome and you start thinking that, well, I'm not as bad as them. I, I deserve heaven. Uh, no, you don't. None of us do. There's no way that we can earn and deserve heaven because we would have to be perfect. And if we went into heaven the way we are, we would corrupt heaven. It would basically be like God allowing Satan to have his way with his wife and to promulgate his seed with his wife. Right? Because ultimately, until we're born again, we are basically children of Satan. And because of our sinful nature, where we naturally desire to be selfish and to do sinful things because we find pleasure in it, we would do that in heaven. Because it would be a hell to go to heaven and have to just control our sinful nature. We would let it loose. And then that would be spreading Satan's seed among God's wife, right? Allowing some disgusting thing like that to happen. And yet we think God's going to allow that. No, we all deserve hell because we think we're not bad, but we're comparing ourselves to other people. But when you compare yourself to God, you realize, I do deserve hell. 
because God has never even thought about doing anything wrong. So when he looks at us, where we, we may not do it, but we dwell on it, we meditate upon it. And he's like, wow, I would never even have thought those things. So compared to God in heaven, you look evil just because of your thoughts, yet alone the things that you say and do. So you need to judge yourself from the perspective of heaven, not from the perspective of sinful man. And it, you, that starts to humble you to realize, well, then how do I get saved? How am I supposed to go to heaven then? Well, you can't. Because even if you keep the law to the best of your ability, like Jesus did, well, you already failed because the law is summed up with loving your God, with all you got and loving you, your fellow man as yourself. And you fail automatically because what's your intention? It's not from a pure heart. I'm just going to put an S down here. It's from a selfish heart. Because you're doing it so that you won't go to hell and you're doing it so that you'll go to heaven. So you already, again, you fail. And all you're ultimately doing is suppressing and covering up your sinful nature. And it becomes a burden where you have to be constantly on alert, controlling your sinful nature. And all your focus, again, is on self and on your sin. Right? You're just focused on that. So you end up producing self-righteousness. Right? Thinking that you're better than other people and that you deserve heaven and they don't. Which ties into a video I'm going to do after this one. But, you, again, you fail. Right? Because you're, you're in pure heart. And not only that, all you're doing is controlling your sinful nature. You're basically like a trained dog. A trained dog that controls its nature doesn't become a human, right? It's just a well-trained dog. For that dog to be eating at the table with the rest of mankind, it has to be born again as a man, right? In the same manner, for us to go to heaven, we can't go to heaven as the dogs we are, even if we're well-trained dogs. We must be born again. And that comes, like Peter says in 1 Peter 1, verses 23 through 25, by receiving that gospel, which is first that humble pie that you need the Savior because you are damned. And if you could eat that humble pie, then you're on that first step where you start to look to God and be like, well, then how can I be saved? And you cry out to him. Have mercy on me, a sinner. And that's when he gives you grace. Mercy is giving you something that, I should rephrase that. Mercy is not getting what you deserve, which is hell. That's where you have Jesus come up on that cross there. He gets what you deserve. And then you get grace where, what does Jesus deserve? Let's just use some yellow here. Let's just call this heaven for right now. He deserves that. You get that even though you don't deserve it. So that's grace right there. This is mercy and grace, right? Mercy is Jesus getting what you deserve and you not getting it. That's mercy, right? Not getting the punishment you deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve, which is heaven. It's what Jesus deserves. He's willing to give you his life if you would give him yours. This is where he offers you salvation. This is the only way to be saved is through Jesus Christ. He says on the way, the truth, and the life. Anybody who tries to come up here any other way is a thief and a robber. This is the only way. And let's use, uh, let's use some purple here because it's a mixture of the blood of Jesus and the spirit of God represented by red and blue. You bring that together, you get purple. So we'll just make this into Kind of a ladder here. Jesus is the only way. You have to die. And then you are clothed in his righteousness. You're given that perfect life he lived. That's why he lived that perfect life under the law. He didn't do it for shits and giggles to prove he can. He did it so that you can be saved because he wants to give you that life. He wants to give you credit for that life. But in order for you to have credit for that life, you have to give up yours. So you have to lay down... Not just your sins at the cross, but your 
righteousness, everything good about you that makes you think that you're better than anybody else and everything that you think makes you deserving of heaven. You need to lay that down at the cross and accept what Jesus has done for you here. This is the only way. You start putting, uh, oh, I'm keeping the law. So let's do something here. Uh, an L here. Let's circle that. Disconnect it from the line, come from the seed. You, you want to keeping the law here. Uh, you're not going to go here, right? This is basically, again, like the seed of poison ivy or something, right? You're not producing actually good fruit, right? Where people might not recognize the poison ivy as something bad, right? A lot of people don't know what poison ivy looks like. You just think it's another plant, but then you rub up against it. And next thing you know, hey, uh, this, this isn't good, right? But uh, ultimately, even if you produce some berries and other stuff, uh, they're not edible, right? They're either toxic or they make you throw up, they give you diarrhea. They do something that it's not really beneficial. So everything that's producing, even if it looks good, is not good, right? And, uh, yeah, again, the only way right here. So you, you planting these good seeds about the gospel. Let's put some other ones because you keep talking about it, right? And discussing it. And right now you're watching this video. So you're, you're thinking about it. You're, you're arguing with me in your, in your mind or with, with whoever you're watching the video with. So there's seeds being planted in your heart because you're thinking about it. You're meditating on it. And when you start to believe it, that's when the seeds actually get into the heart. They get buried in there. And now they just need some water. They just need some light. And that can happen from different things here. Where you start to realize how God saved you. You start to see God and start to know him. And how he's for you. He's not against you. He loves you. And he sheds great amounts of mercy and grace upon you. You start seeing this. Then you start to produce this fruit here. To be like Jesus. And that's where this, let's turn this into light now. That seed, you may be hearing it from someone like me right now in this video. And some seeds are being planted, right? But it doesn't mean they're going to germinate. But then when there's somebody living a good life, a Christian life, that shines some light. And all of a sudden that seed that's in there, you see them living that life and you're kind of like, you know what? Uh, I kind of like that life. Like this person's actually honest. This person's genuine. This person's real. All right? They're honest. And there's some innocence to them. Some purity to them. And you start thinking, I want to be like that. That seed right there starts to germinate. And then that's when... This cross starts to come up out of the heart there, but there also needs to be some water, right? Let's drop some rain. And these people sometimes are given the light. They're they're praying, right? Praying that their influence does some good for somebody, right? And sometimes they don't realize that the spirit of God is flowing from them with the things that they're saying and doing. And sometimes they're praying for you, right? So there's water, and then that germinates. And then the person not only believes, now they understand. And now they have that Jacob's ladder there, the stairway to heaven. And they're there, and they become like this up here. And let's just put a C here for Christian. You're born again, right? And you're becoming a light to the world. And you're doing this same process for somebody else. And then these other seeds here represent the deeper things of the word of God. And they start to take root because you start to believe. And the Holy Spirit starts to open up your understanding. 
so much deeper roots. And now what comes forth is these plants that start producing some fruit. This is fruit of the spirit here. You get like a, a mighty tree coming out of here. We'll call this the tree of, of life here. Okay. Uh, thank you for dealing with my artistry here. But I tell you what I'm drawing so that uh, you can go, okay, yeah, I, I, I see it. I kind of, yeah, okay, it's a tree, okay. <laughs> and then uh, we'll put some fruit, all right? And it all comes again from God, all of it, because the seed is the word of God, right? The, the Christian that's shining light is living by the word of God. And a lot of times this, this light is actually you thinking about Jesus and his life. It's shining light on the, the word of God that's being planted in your heart where you're trying to now follow the light. Because that's what the plants do when they come up, right? They seek the light. So you're seeking God, Jesus Christ. The light giver, the life giver, and then, then there's rain to make it so you receive the spirit of God so that you can actually stand in the presence of God. Because without the spirit, without this water, the plants dry up and die. So you need the spirit of God and the spirit of God gets in the plants. So now it's able to stand before God. So you need the, the whole nine yards here, right? And this is what, what goes on in the heart. But you see with a lot of people, let, let's use this seed over here. What they got is they got uh, a seed there that says uh, there is no God. So some people are like atheists and they got this big iron tree here. Well, that, that would have went a bit off there. And uh, it's not natural, so we're going to make it look a little bit weird. It has like an iron iron trunk and it has pink leaves. All right? A lot of these atheists are, are like that, right? Like to dye their hair all kinds of crazy colors. Sometimes, I, you know, I admit it looks kind of cool or whatever, but uh, whatever. So you got this here, and it's taken a, a deep root, and there's like no space for the word of God, right? Because all the seeds, they they hit this tree here, and they they bounce, and they they land off somewhere else, right? Their mind does not allow. The word of God in a lot of times with these people, it's because they're they're influenced by uh, the government and the education system, so it sets up this this tree in their hearts. Sometimes it's because they're on the devil's lettuce there, the marijuana, right, and they are on some other drug, and this builds up this tree here where they will not receive the the word of God, right. And that's kind of like when you receive the word of God and you're born again, the devil also, he's trying to throw seeds in there, right? About, hey, you're, you, you're not worthy, right? You don't deserve this, right? He's trying to throw this in or there is no God. You're crazy, right? And, and trying to put you under the law or trying to get you to turn on God. All kinds of stuff, trying to throw these seeds, but again, they bounce off because they bounce off of the tree of life, the cross that has grown up and rooted in your heart and now stands strong in your mind. So these seeds bounce off where you're like, no, we're not allowing the lies and the bullshit in because you allow the words of lies and bullshit to get in. They can take a root where some of these people over here, they're not atheists. They believe, oh, Roman Catholicism is the one true church. 
and they they have a uh, scarlet and purple so we'll make their tree like that and their tree rejects the gospel where these Roman Catholics they don't even know the gospel they don't know the good news of our salvation you ask them what the gospel is they're like yeah it's the four gospels of Matthew Mark Luke and John and it's like uh, okay well what's the message and they can't they can't tell you what the good news is and the the very few ones that can tell you the good news is how Jesus Christ died for your sins was buried and rose again for your justification according to the scriptures they don't believe it because then it's like oh, okay so you believe God saved you no that's an assumption how's an assumption to believe God when he tells you I saved you so you see they 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 got this tree up that rejects the word of God right and you need to tear down these trees by showing them the errors so basically what you'll be doing is let's make an axe out here Lay into the axe to all these trees here. This is spiritually speaking. You're not literally taking an axe to these people, so don't twist my words here. All of this here is like metaphoric, analogy, a typology, a, a parable. Okay? Spiritually, you're destroying these lies of these false doctrines, these false beliefs. And even to this tree over here, these plants are the legalists. You, you take the axe to it, right? Let's show that swinging. You do the same thing to this one here, right? And you chop this one down. And you may have to do the same thing. You'll get practice by doing this in your own heart. And you start to realize why people won't let go because you might have some seeds in here even though you're born again you still have beliefs that aren't true that have taken root so let's use a different color for the, the root system here so these false beliefs have taken root and they've grown up and they're producing some fruit and that's why people think that you're lost or something right but these things would be something like let's say evolution you don't believe God actually created everything. You believe he did so through evolution, right? We actually evolved from things that are not even alive or conscious into what we are today, even though that's not science at all, right? Because through science, something that we can actually observe and test and experiment with, we can see that life only comes from something that's already alive, and consciousness only comes from something that's already conscious. There's nothing... To show, except for imagination and speculation, which is not science, that something that's not living and not conscious can produce something that is alive and is conscious, right? So that would be putting the axe to these beliefs. And you start truly believing the Word of God. So now there's more space and more soil in the heart for the Word of God to produce good fruit. So you have practice. Humbling yourself, realizing, hey, I spent my life teaching this stuff and, it, and believing this stuff, and it's not true. I was deceived, right? You eat some humble pie, then you, you actually tear up these roots. You tear up these weeds in your own heart, right? So now you understand when you're reaching as other people that it's tough to humble yourself. It's tough to admit that you're wrong, especially the older you get. The older you get, you've probably been rejecting the truth for a long time, and you've been more dedicated to this lie. The lie has deeper and stronger roots. So even if you chop down the BS, right, it still has deep roots, and it grows back like a weed. It's still in there. That's why it's best not to allow that BS into the heart into the first place. Where with your children, you need to prepare their soil and not allow them to be going on their own phones and their own tablets where you don't know the BS that's getting into their hearts and minds and taking root. Where you're not paying attention to the stuff that they listen to 
and that they watch and that they indulge in. You don't know the things that they are being taught and the seeds that are being planted. Right? You need to be on that because when these seeds get in, especially when you're young, well, now they're going to take deep root. And it's going to be harder to get to work to chop down what, which is not just pulling up weeds anymore. You're chopping down trees, which is a lot more difficult than just pulling up some weeds, right? But with God, all things are possible, right? Because you can be praying for these people. You're, you're, you're working. You took us off to, to pull up the weeds and pull up even stones because a lot of times they just got a stone heart where they don't allow anything in. Like they're a nihilist. They don't believe a thing, right? They just, it's just a stony ground. And so you bring the jackhammer or something, right? You might do some work, but it's tiring and exhausting. And times it's like, it doesn't seem like I'm getting anywhere. And you may not be getting anywhere, but that's where you just live your Christian life up here in heavenly places. And you just shine light by living your Christian life. And you don't realize the power of the sun to dry up these plants. Because they don't have the spirit of God. They're not receiving any of the water. And these things dry up. And the roots become brittle. You just have to, don't even have to pay attention to them. You just paying attention to God, living your Christian life, and the, the light dries them up. And then you, you also, there's the other part here, you become the salt of the earth. And I can't use white here, so let's use uh, orange, I guess. We'll use orange, where you're also the salt of the earth. And you're you're adding to this being dried up because you're preserving the word and you're not allowing any nutrients to get to these trees because you're not enabling them saying, oh, yeah, let's just all get along, you know, go along to get along kind of thing. Right. And just putting up with their beliefs. No, you're constantly on them about how their beliefs are BS. You're being the salt of the earth. You're being an irritant and you're drying up these plants. So they're becoming weak. So you're not even sitting there really arguing with them. You're just saying, nope, that's not true. Right? Anytime they bring up an argument, you just, nope. Right? You, you counter it. Or just with your life, you show how that's not true. And then you sit there and you pray and you pray. And when you pray... You don't even know in the world, spiritual world, there's a cloud, a storm brewing. I'm using blue so you can see the blue on the white here. The opposite, you know, the sky's white and the cloud is blue, right? We're doing the opposite here. You know, this is a storm cloud, right? It's uh, it's full of rain here. All these plants and everything have been drying out. And all of a sudden, it's going to be a, just a downpour of the Holy Spirit. And you thought, you know what, I'm not getting these people. I don't think anybody can be saved. I don't think I'm going to reach anybody. Right? But then all of a sudden, God is just like, I'm going to come through now. I used you to prepare the way like John the Baptist, right? Prepare the way for the Lord. John the Baptist... Yeah, he might have looked like he had some success, whatever, but there was something new coming, a new covenant. And he prepared the way here. And he even mentioned about the axe is going to be laid to all the trees that aren't producing fruit. And you got the Holy Spirit comes in, and now you have this flood that comes through here. Let's bring this flood in here. And, whoops, all right, we'll go with that. <laughs> the flood just wipes out all that vegetation, right? And now, the soil is ready to receive the word of God so that they may be like this here. 
and then be born again, where they're a child of God, where they are dead, and their life is hid with Christ in God, where they are actually in heavenly places right now. And that's an, just another illustration of what's going on in the heart and why you need to be paying attention to the things that you're thinking about and dwelling upon and what you allow into your own heart. And you need to do work on ripping up all the things that are contrary to God within your own heart and mind because then when it's in your heart, it starts to affect your mind. And then when you start reading the Word of God or you start talking to other Christians, you disagree with them when they wholeheartedly believe in the Word of God, but you think, hey, that can't be true because it doesn't line up with my belief because you're being influenced by the seeds that have taken a deep root in your heart. Right? You need to be aware of these things and aware of how they're affecting your, your wife and your children and those in your influence. Make sure you're not planting bad seeds, that you're being a light, right? That you're not being a darkness, right? So that they're receiving good influence, they're receiving a good seed. And all, this whole time that these trees are here, these plants are here, you're talking to them. There might be the word of God is in that heart there. They just don't truly believe it. They, they're thinking about the things you say because they want to counter what you say. So the more that you're talking to them and they're trying to counter you, they're actually thinking about the Word of God. So the Word of God gets in there, and then once these trees and vines and weeds are ripped up, all of a sudden the Word of God can germinate and breach forth, and they, they become a believer that understands what God has done for them. And they are now saved, right? And then they join us up here. Uh, so just another video to encourage you to keep on keeping on, right? And to be mindful of these things with another crazy looking illustration. So thanks for watching and take care. All right, I just wanted to make a quick video here to put at the end of all my videos, encouraging you to prayfully get into the scriptures as we read here in Hebrews chapter 12 at verse 2, it says, Looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And this is very interesting that it refers to Jesus as the author of our faith. An author is somebody who writes. And in Romans chapter 10, verses 16 and 17, it says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So you see here how Jesus is the author and finisher of our, finisher of our, of our faith, and how you get faith from hearing the word of God. Jesus is the word of God. The Bible, the scriptures, are the written word of God. It is God in our world. It's God's representative in our world, and that would be the King James Bible. And if you're saying it doesn't say read, it says hear. Well, then read it out loud, my friends. I know some of you are wise asses, and that's what you're going to say. Well, then read it out loud. And you build your faith. And you notice how obeying the gospel here is about believing it. That's how you obey it. The gospel is the good news of our salvation. That Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again according to the scriptures. But coming back to the word of God here, we are told in Isaiah 34, 16, Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. This is very fitting because Isaiah has 66 chapters, just like there's 66 books in the Bible. And if you do a study on this, you can see that each chapter of Isaiah lines up with each book of the Bible. The first chapter for Genesis, the last chapter for Revelation. Have fun doing that. And why should you seek out the book in the, of the Lord and read? So that Jesus never tells you this, ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God, as we read here in Matthew 22, 29, when he's talking to the Sadducees who are coming to him with a very silly question. 
that anybody could answer if they actually knew the scriptures. But you see, the Sadducees, they didn't use the whole Old Testament. They just used Moses. So they didn't get the light from the Old Testament to help you understand the Torah. Just like the New Testament shines light and helps you understand the Old Testament. None of it adds or removes from what Moses wrote. It helps you understand what Moses wrote. That's why Isaiah tells us here in Isaiah 8 verse 20, to the law, which is the instructions, the Torah, what God told Moses to write, that's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five books of your Bible there. It says, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So you see, you test the people to see if they actually have light in them. There's people who have an outward show of light, as Satan himself can come as an angel of light and his ministers as ministers of righteousness. But how do you test the spirits to see if there's truly light in them? They have to line up according to the scriptures. Jesus was not afraid to be tested in the scriptures. He would say, have you not read? It is written. To search the scriptures. Bring them up. They testify of me. Right? He wasn't worried about that. Paul wasn't either. Acts 17, 11. He wasn't worried about being tested in the scriptures. He didn't make some nonsense about you can't understand the scriptures. You need me to interpret them. No, he, he actually called the Barians noble for hearing what he had to say and then searching the scriptures to see if it was so. Because that's what we're supposed to do. If you don't line up with the scriptures, you're not of God. Very simple, very easy. God made it very easy for us to know him and to know who is not of him. He gave us his word and it's super simple. If it doesn't line up with him, then obviously it's somebody else trying to say that they're from him. A stranger. Trying to kidnap you, right? And what does Jesus tell us about the word in John 17, 17? He says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So you Christians that want to be sanctified and you're trying to sanctify yourself by repenting of all your sins so that you become sinless. You want that sanctification. You need to get into the word because when you have the word abiding in you, God changes you from the inside out where you're not making the change where you sanctify yourself by becoming some sinless being, by focusing on your sins and fighting against them. No, that's just cleaning the outside of the cup and containing your sinful nature. You need to come to Jesus to be born again, sealed with his Holy Spirit and become one with his spirit. And as Jesus says in John 6, 63, his word is spirit and it is truth. Flesh profits nothing. You get into the word. You are partaking of the Spirit of God, and God's Spirit is life-giving, as we see in Genesis, bringing life to things that have no life. You want that life. You want to be sanctified. You need to get into the Word. As we're told here in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 27, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So how do you receive this cleansing? By getting into the word. It is spirit. The spirit is in reference to water. You want that cleansing? Get into the word. That's where you are going to be sanctified. So that you would be without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. No blemish whatsoever. You need to get into the word so that... Jesus is abiding in you, and you are abiding in him. You see that? So, moving on to this last verse here, John 17, 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Because the only way to know the Father is to know the Son. You can't come to the Father without going through Jesus. When you know Jesus, you know the Father, because they are one. Jesus is the Father in the flesh. And eternal life is to know them. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 7, to these people who are doing a lot of great works in his name, they're prophesying in his name, they're casting out devils in his name, 
they were doing many mighty works in his name. And Jesus says, I never knew you. You see, you're saved not because of your works, not because you repented of your sins, not because you're perfect and you've deserved it and you've earned it somehow, that you've proven yourself. No, you're saved because of your relationship with God. If you've come to the cross and have been born again, then you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. You become one spirit with the Lord. There's no way Jesus can say, I never knew you. Because he knows you. He made you anew at the cross. He knows you intimately. You're saved at that point. You need to have that deep relationship with God. Just as Adam knew Eve and she conceived, you need to know God on that level where you are born again. You receive the word of God, which is the seed of God, into your heart, which would be your womb. And there was a man, you might not want to think of that, but that's how it is. Eat the humble pie so that you receive the seed of God that you may be born again. You see, the women help us understand our role to God. Because to God, we are the bride, the bride of Christ. We are as the woman. So you need to eat the humble pie, receive the seed so that you can be born again. But a lot of Christians, they are just like a lot of women today. We don't need a man. So they're never going to be born again. Right? A lot of Christians, we don't need God. We can do it ourselves. And they take on the name Christian. Christians seem to be the easiest people to fool. Because all you got to do is say you're Christian. And they'll follow after you. You can be preaching lies because they don't test you to the scriptures. Donald Trump is a good example of a lot of Christians just blindly following him because he said he was Christian. Even though when he asked was asked if he comes to Jesus to ask for forgiveness. He says, no, no, I don't really do that. I, I don't really see myself as a bad person, and I just try to do better. So he's not a Christian. He's never been born again. He doesn't believe the gospel, the good news of our salvation. He doesn't even believe he needs it. Yet the Christians are holding him up as if he's Christian and as if he's the, the savior of our country. Right? They're making an idol out of him. And he obviously, he's a pompous ass, right? And the only reason why he looks good is because the left looks so bad. If it wasn't because of the left looking so hideous, you would be able to see clearly that Trump is no better. He just says you what you want to hear. But then somebody like me, who preaches to you the truth, but then I might say a word you don't like. Like I might say shit or ass, and all of a sudden you're offended and you turn off the video right here saying this guy's not a Christian, you never listen to a thing I say, because I said a couple of words that the Bible doesn't say not to say. The Bible doesn't say not to say any words like that. It says not to have corrupt speaking and guile. Corrupt speaking is what you get from politicians like Trump. That lie. And that's what guile is. It's manipulation. Fake feigned words. Flattery. I'm not doing that. I'm not speaking anything corrupt. I'm just instead of saying crap or butt, sometimes I end up saying shit or ass. And me saying that right now, you probably getting mad. And that's probably because you're immature. Christian, or not even Christian at all. You're just Christian in name only. And that's why you follow fake Christians so easily. So if you're offended by such things, have fun. Go away. You're not breaking my heart. You're, you're not taking anything from me. You're only hurting yourself by rejecting the truth and following after bullshit. So thanks for watching. Now I'm going to splice into something from Rockman that I really enjoy for the end of this. Take care. That fella couldn't join the church. He couldn't join the church. He couldn't get baptized. He couldn't get baptized. He woke up with God. He woke up with the devil. Are you saved?
So the fella didn't take the sacraments, didn't take the sacraments. Didn't say the rosary, didn't take the rosary. Didn't tithe, didn't tithe. He went to heaven, he went to hell. You say? Didn't keep the law, he didn't keep the law. He broke the commandments, he broke the commandments. He didn't keep the golden rule, he didn't keep the golden rule. He woke up in glory, he woke up in the pit. Are you saved? You're saved, but you're not saved. You're over here or you're over here. You sure ain't in the middle. He said, Lord, remember me, thou comest thy kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and said, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be saved. It's like that. You have been saved? If you ever saved, you were saved like that. Amen. 